So good afternoon, everybody. Just to let you know, uh, yeah, today I got my first shot of the coronavirus vaccine. And I just went to brazoshub.com. That's that link that's on the chat. And uh, it's still right now we are on phase 1C that you can just people over 50 and also people over 18 with chronic conditions or health professionals are supposed to take it. But, and in this website, every Friday at 10 a.m., they open registration. But yesterday on the local news, they said that there were not enough people getting vaccines. There were a lot of leftover. So they opened to the general public and I was able to get a uh, spot there. So just for your information, it is already possible, even if you're not 50 years old plus to get vaccinated. So today we'll continue on our lecture about fertility and um, we will start on, on slides, we start on the framework for predicting fertility in before like Thursday, in the previous week before the last one, we went up to mean length of a generation, and then we had the exam on last Tuesday, and no class due to the university calendar last Thursday. But I mentioned to you that I would like to show exactly how to calculate these indicators in an Excel spreadsheet. So the first one that we saw was the age-specific fertility rate, the ASFR, that it basically have to have the number of women by these five year age groups going from 15 to 49. And in this example here, this spreadsheet is now our course website, as I mentioned before, you can download the zip file and then um, and, and just see these calculations down there. And you can download this, you won't compress the file, you're gonna see the Excel file. And to calculate the age specific fertility rates, you also need uh, the number of births that happen in those specific years for women in those same age groups. Oh, and by the way, my camera here, I don't know what's not working, it's a problem in the classroom, and I cannot see the chat. So if you want to ask a question, just unmute yourself and ask a question, okay? Thank you. So you pretty much just have to divide the cells on the spreadsheet with births by the cells on the spreadsheet with the female population. And that's what I do here in the spreadsheet in this specific tab. So here, I'm pretty much getting the cell from the births divided by the cell from the population, the female population. So it's pretty much dividing each one of the cells here, the B4 divided by the B4. And I do that for everything, for all these different cells here. So here's B8 by B8, and for all the years as well. And with this, we have the age-specific fertility rates for 1994, Brazil, and uh, taking into account information from women between 15 and 49, which is usually the standard in demography. To calculate the total fertility rate, you pretty much just add all these numbers and multiply by five, by five because that's the width of the interval. Women with 15, 16, 17, 18, and 19 are all subject to these fertility rates. So that's why we multiply by five. And the 1.8 is that hypothetical measure in the demography that I mentioned to you. That means that if we get a hypothetical group of women and we expose them to this fertility rate a bit, uh, throughout the years from 15 to 49, they will have on average 1.82. Why is that a hypothetical cohort? Because women from 15 to 19, let's say 1995, they're exposed to these rates here. But when they turn 20, they will be exposed to these rates here. So the real rates are for this woman who are 15 to 19, 1995, they're gonna be 20 to 24 in 2000. 
and they're going to be 25 to 29 in 2005. So that's the real cohort. If I wanted to calculate the total fertility rate of this cohort of women who were 15 years old in 1995, I would have to wait all these years here to calculate the, the rates for each one of their age groups. If I get here information from one specific year, sum them all and multiply by five, I'm getting different cohorts. Women who are uh, 15 years old in 1996, who were 20 years old in 1996. So when I analyze this group here together, I'm saying that's a hypothetical cohort of women who would have experienced these eight specific fertility rates throughout their childbearing years. So that's why it's called a hypothetical cohort. The same thing we're gonna see for the mortality rates when we estimate the life expectancy at birth, okay? The cool thing about the age specific fertility rates is that we can plot them and we can plot them by the age groups. And that's exactly this graph here. So this graph is showing the age specific fertility rates for each one of the age groups. And let me see that the age group between 2024 has higher rates, higher chance of having children, and then they drop over time. It gets all messed up here because I have just too many years. And we usually show these graphs more for every five years data going, for example, from 1970 to 2000 every five years. So it's easy to see. But this is just an example of how to calculate it. The total fertility rate is interesting because it summarizes in one single number all these age specific fertility rates for that year. So that's only the age specific fertility rate. We talk about many others in, in the lecture. And this other file about fertility rates in the US, and in this case, you're only for 2012, which is also saved in the same compressed file in our course website, I will show you other rates that we can estimate. So the same age groups, five-year age groups from 15 to 49. The midpoint of the age group, I pretty much just get this case here. The first age on this group plus the first age on this group and divided by two. So that's the midpoint of this specific age group. Here is 20 plus 25 divided by two and so on. Until this one here, 45 plus 50 divided by two. The cells here that are in yellow, they are data that I collected from other places. And the cells that are in, in in white are the ones that I estimated here, right? So, so I'm pretty much to say that the cells in yellow are the data that we have to collect in order to estimate these indicators. So in the same way that I did for the spreadsheet for Brazil, we have to have the number of women in a specific year, in this case in 2012, specific place, United States, by these five year age groups. And here we have the number of births to women in those age groups. And here we pretty much can uh, add everything, all women. We had 73.7 million women that year and who gave birth to uh, almost 4 million children. Okay? So uh, the general uh, fertility rate, we pretty much get this number here, the total number of babies born in that specific year for those women between 15 to 49 and divide by the number of women. So it's pretty much, I'm getting this sum here divided by this sum and I multiply by 1000, that's the standard. So we have a general fertility uh, rate of 53.6 uh, births for every 1000 women. So for every 1,000 women in the U.S. in 2012, we had 53.6 births, okay? And it's pretty much the same thing as dividing this one by this one. here. So that's the, the general fertility rate. The total fertility rate, it's how I did in the Brazilian spreadsheet. We first have to calculate the age-specific fertility rate. 
And in this case, I just get this cell divided by this one. This one is this cell divided by this. And we add them all, we get this number, and we multiply this number by five because these are five-year age groups. The total fertility rate here, what does it mean? If we expose a group of women to this age-specific fertility rate throughout their childbearing years, they would have on average 1.88 children. Why the total fertility rate, people prefer that instead of the general fertility rate? Because the total fertility rate takes into account the age distribution. We calculate each fertility rate here for each specific age group. We calculate here by this, and we calculate this one here using these two cells. In this case here, the general fertility rate, rate we do not that. We just get the total divided by the total of women and multiply by 1,000. And then we get the 53.6. That's how we do it. But if you have a country that have more women between 20 and 29 years of age, those women are more likely to have children. So we are not controlling for age composition. The total fertility rate takes into account age composition. And by doing that, we are estimating chances, specific chances for these groups here in the US, for example, the groups between 25 and 29 and 30 to 34 had the highest rates. You're taking into account the age composition of that country in that specific year. And the total fertility rate, as I mentioned before, we, if it's below 2.1 children per woman, we say that that country has fertility below replacement level. Because the fertility rate, we expect that women will produce at least two children that will replace themselves and their partners. Why 2.1 and not just two? because we still have uh, a sex ratio at birth above 100 because we have more boys than girls. So we have to produce more babies to have enough girls to replace their mothers. And also because we, as some of these babies that will be born to this woman will not reach reproductive ages, right? So we have to take into account mortality as well. Another measure that we talked about a, two other measures that we talked about, they took into account not all births to women, but only female births. How many daughters this woman here had in 2012 in the United States? So out of this 10.4 million women between 15 to 19, 305,000 had babies. We had a total of 305,000 babies. And out of those, 149,000 uh, daughters, so female babies. And you see that this information here is a little bit more difficult to find for some countries, for developing countries. But for countries as the US, we do have information about the sex of the child. So we can calculate the number of female births. And with that, we can estimate the age-specific fertility rates of female births. And as I explained here, equals the column six, which is female births, divided by the population of women, the female population. So it's pretty much dividing this cell by this cell and so on. And then we add everything and then we multiply this sum by five, we have the gross uh, reproduction rate. The gross reproduction rate is saying, what is it saying? If we expose a hypothetical group of women to this age-specific female birth rates throughout their reproductive years, they will have on average 0.917 daughters. So if we expose women to these rates here of having daughters, throughout their reproductive lives, broken down by age group, they will have on average 0.917 dollars. And that's below the replacement level in this case here, because it's below one, because we would expect that each woman 
would have one daughter that would replace herself in the next generation. And then the next exercise, so here, the total fertility rate, we take into account um, age composition by calculating the age-specific fertility rates for each one of the age groups. For the gross reproduction uh, rate, we take into account also the age composition, but now only female births. But we know that some of these women here who are alive in the age group of 15 to 19, they will not be alive in the age group to 20 to 24 and 25 to 29. Some of these women will die before reaching the next um, age group. So they will not be subject, they will not be exposed to these chances of having children because they die. So how do you take into account not only information only about female births, but also about uh, mortality? You get this information from what we're going to see more in detail in the next chapters, in the chapter specifically about mortality. You use information from the life table. What is the life table? The life table, that's where we estimate the life expectancy at birth. How many years on average people are living if they were exposed to the current mortality rates. So we have the mortality rates by age groups, the same way that we have here for fertility rates by age groups. In the life table, we have mortality rates by age groups. And with that, we can estimate here, this is gonna be one of the columns of our table. We can estimate the number of women surviving to that specific age interval. And these numbers here, they just make sense. You should take into account this number here. This is the overall number of women in that life table that were born. And then we are counting how many of them will survive into this, the survive to the beginning of these age groups here. Why is 495 and here is 100,000? Uh, because we have to multiply this by five, because here we have five year age groups. So in that specific, the number of women that survived to age zero in that specific light table was 500,000. As they die, these numbers drop. So you see that these numbers always drop. These are the number of women who are dying before reaching the next age, uh, age group. So how do we calculate based on these two sets of information here, the proportion of women surviving to the midpoint of each one of these age groups? We get the number of women surviving to the age interval and divide by five times 100,000. Let's remember. If I have women here surviving to 15 years of age, I have 495,615 women out of 500,000. That means that I have 99.12% of women surviving to the midpoint of that age interval, right? I'm pretty much getting each one of these numbers and divided by 500,000 five times L0. L0 is also called the radix of the life table, as we're going to see. It. So this 494,662 divided by 500,000 is 98.93% of women. So we see that women are dying. At the beginning here, we had 99% of women, and here 96%. So now we apply this mortality here into the age-specific fertility rates taking into account only female births. So we multiply the age-specific fertility rate that only takes into account fertility birth, uh, female births, which is this one, and multiply by this information of proportion of women surviving to that interval. And then this would be the daughters for surviving women during the five-year interval. 
So in this case here, I just multiply the female births per woman by the proportion of women surviving, and I get this number. And you see that these numbers here, oops, sorry. You see that these numbers here are smaller than these numbers here. Because here, I'm taking into account the mortality factor, and these numbers decrease. Of course, here up to the fourth decimal case is the same, but if you just look at uh, more decimal cases, you're going to see differences here. This number here is smaller than this number. So now I just add all these uh, rates that is taking into account only female births and mortality, and I multiply by five. And then I get the net reproduction rate. Why this one is called gross reproduction rate and why this one is called the net reproduction rate? The gross uh, reproduction rate is not taking into account mortality of women. The net reproduction rate is taking into account of women. It's considered that women will die in this period here and will not produce as many daughters as we would expect. So if we expose a group of women to these rates here of female births, considering mortality of women, women would have on average 0 0.904 daughters. That's how we interpret that, right? And then that final uh, slide about the mean length of a generation, we pretty much get this column here, which is this one, multiplied by the, the width of the age group and multiply by the midpoint of the age group. So we finally use this information here. So what we are doing, we multiply this cell here, which is here, number 10, by five, which is, we multiply by five because that's the width of each one of these age groups. And the midpoint of the age group is 17.5. So that's an approximation. You're pretty much saying that woman between 15 and 19, on average, they have children around the age of 17.5. So our assumption is that women between 15 and 19 are having children with the same chances within that interval. So that's the assumption of this indicator. And the same thing for everything else. We have the assumption that women between 35 to 39 are have babies with the same chances within that interval. So that's why we use the midpoint of age group of 35.5. So we, uh, we are pretty much multiplying the column two by column 10, but also we uh, also had to include the width of the, of the interval that I did not put here, which is the I. We add all this information and we get this divide by the net reproduction rate. And we get that if we expose uh, woman to these rates of having female births, and we did consider the fact of mortality, there they would have children around the age of 28.6, right? So that's how you interpret it. That's how at the average age in which they are having daughters, considering the information about mortality. Okay, so that's how you calculate all these different uh, fertility rates. And you can simply collect this information here that's highlighted in yellow from a specific year, can be for a state, can be for a county, can be for a city. Usually this information here of female births and also mortality is harder to find. But if you do, then you can do estimation of all these different indicators. And here is the same thing as I did for the case of Brazil. I'm just plotting the age-specific fertility rates by age group, just to show that in the US 2012, uh, women between 25 and 29 were the ones having more chances of having children. And it drops afterwards. But you see kind of like a postponement in fertility because developing countries have these rates here between 2024 20, higher than these rates of 25, 29, okay?
So that's the um, I show on the on Excel how we can calculate all these rates here that are used to the mean length of a generation, net reproduction rate, gross reproduction rate, and total fertility rate, age specific fertility rate, and general fertility rate. Right. So that's what the spreadsheet is doing. So after we estimate the fertility rates, it's good to understand why the fertility rates have that specific pattern, have that specific level in a country. So we are trying to explain why um, those countries, they have more higher fertility rates between women of 25 to 29 instead of 20 to 24, for example. Or oh, why is fertility declining overall throughout time? So whenever we are trying to explain why fertility is like that, we are trying to see what are the factors that influence the levels and the patterns of fertility. So here, Bongertz, John Bongertz, he created this overall framework for predicting fertility. And some authors be before him also had uh, discussed that, but here he summarizes as, we have this major uh, socioeconomic, cultural, attitudinal, family planning, environmental variables in specific countries in specific years. And those are these major contextual determinants, indirect determinants that make women be more likely or less likely to have children. And those indirect determinants affect some other variables, some other characteristics of women, that these characteristics here, they will be the ones closely related to having higher or smaller chances of women having children. These variables that closely explain why women are having more or less children in specific countries in specific years are called proximate determinants of fertility. So the proximate determinants of fertility are influenced by this overall contextual indirect determinants of fertility that um, are characteristics of that specific country, of that specific region, that specific year. They influence these other factors and they will influence fertility. So in this portion of the lecture, I'm going to discuss a little bit more about these proximate determinants of fertility. What are they? How can we estimate the proximate determinants of fertility and see which ones are influencing more or less fertility in a specific country? So, actually, this uh, discussion about these intermediate variables and proximate determinants of fertility, they started with Davis and Blake back in 1955. So they were trying to understand what are these intermediate variables that are the intermediaries between the indirect determinants and fertility. So Davis and Blake called these variables intermediate variables, which are the means for regulating fertility. And that's how they call them. So intermediate variables are the means of regulating fertility. And they proposed 11 variables through which any social factor influencing the level of fertility would operate. And they divided these 11 variables in three major groups. One group related to intercourse, to sexual activity, another one related to conception, to use of contraceptive methods, and another one related to gestation, to characteristics of women while pregnant. And then, in 1978 and 1982, Bongertz, and I've tried to summarize a little more these intermediate variables proposed by Davis and Blake and call them proximate determinants of fertility. So yeah, yeah, we, I agree that these 11 variables here could be called, uh, are important to explain fertility variations, but four 
out of these 11 variables account for differences in fertility between populations. So he kind of like did a series of studies across countries and realized that if you take into account four variables, you understand why some countries have lower or higher levels of fertility. And of course, the importance of these four variables vary across time and space. So here is, uh, these are the 11 variables proposed by uh, Kingsley Davis and Judith Blake, 1955. And you have age of entry to sexual uh, unions, permanent celibacy, amount of productive period spent after or between unions, voluntary abstinence, involuntary abstinence, coital frequency. These six variables here are under that group that he called intercourse variables. The second group, conception, it's related to measures of fecundity or infecundity, uh, use or non-use of contraception, and fecundity or infecundity affected by voluntary causes. Here is due to involuntary and involuntary causes. In the third group, the gestation variables related to miscarriage and induced abortion. So these are the 11 variables, intermediate variables suggested by Davis and Blake. And then Bonger said that these four variables here, they pretty much, if you have information for different countries in different years about these four variables, you understand what are the, why fertility is changing over time. So it's age of entry to sexual unions, fecundity or infecundity affected by involuntary causes, use or non-use of contraception, and induced abortion. So he proposed these four variables as being the main variables. If you don't have all these other variables here, we can focus on these four, get this data for several countries or for one country over time, and understand what's going on. Because variations on those four variables do explain variations in fertility. So the intermediate variables proposed by Davis and Blake, they pretty much are behavioral or biological variables that are directly influencing fertility. And as I showed in that previous diagram, all their social, economic, cultural, environmental factors are the indirect effects that influence fertility through the intermediate variables. And uh, there is a Blake identified a set of 11 intermediate variables. I showed them in that table before, separated in these three major groups, intercourse, con conception, and gestation. So intercourse is affected by proportion of persons who marry, length of time married, frequency of sexual intercourse while married, Contraception, whether it was the percentage of women using uh, contraception, and usually we measure the modern contraception, voluntary or involuntary fecundity, and then finally, gestation or parturition is the likelihood of miscarriage or abortion. So these 11 intermediate variables directly affect fertility, and I group from these three factors. Uh, saying it again, Bongards operationalize the proximate determinants of fertility to be able to tell them how exactly you have all these 11 variables that Davis and Blake propose. And through extensive work, Bongards realized that four of them are the most important. How exactly do you suggest us estimating indicators to measure these four variables in a way that we can compare countries? or that we can compare the same country over time. In other words, we can do uh, a quantitative analysis of reproduction. So he pretty much proposed this proximate determinants of fertility to facilitate quantitative specification of variables. And it's one of the most useful frameworks for analyzing fertility because he tells us exactly how you estimate variables that are the most important in order to uh, explain fertility changes over time or, be, or fertility variations between countries. So first he had this seven proximate determinants 
marriage and marital disruption, contraceptive use and effectiveness. Because here, effectiveness is important because we, as I just mentioned before, contraception here that is actually more effective in not having children are the modern contraceptive methods, not traditional methods. Prevalence of induced abortion, duration of postpartum infecundability, so duration of breastfeeding. Whenever you hire in societies that women breastfeed their babies for a longer period of time, they have lower chance to have more to get pregnant again. Waiting time to conception, risk of intrauterine mortality, miscarriage, and also of permanent sterility. Okay. And he said, as I mentioned before, that these are the main proximate determinants. The proportion of women married that limit the exposure to intercourse, use of contraceptives, induced abortion, and involuntary infecundability. Proportion of women married. Uh, it's important, it's also related to a series of other factors, such as age. Younger women are less likely to have sexual intercourse and then less likely to have children. Households with both mother and father, there is a closer surveillance of their children, so their children are also less likely to have uh, children. Also, mothers who are well educated, they kind of teach their children or specific their daughters about the cost of pregnancy, about the importance of investing in education and, and a good job before having children. That also influences fertility. In later age at marriage, which is specifically related to proportional marriage, also women who get uh, married at older ages, uh, you have lower levels of fertility. Contraception, abortion, and involuntary fecundity are the main proximate determinants. And again, involuntary fecundity, it means that those women who breastfeed their their children, their babies for a longer period of time will uh, suppress ovulation and then don't be exposed to have more children. So just organizing that previous diagram with the specific variables that Bonger suggests, we have a series of indirect determinants of fertility, socioeconomic, cultural, attitudinal, family planning, environmental characteristics of countries in specific years. Those variables will affect proportion of women marrying, use of contraception, abortion, postpartum fecundability, uh, frequency of intercourse, intrauterine mortality, and sterility. So he's pretty much summarizing here into the seven proximate determinants of fertility. And those are the ones affecting fertility. And the four major ones are exactly the ones that I put here in the top. So he mentioned, so proportional merit, how exactly do you measure that? He's going to propose this marriage pattern index. Contraception, he's going to propose this contra contraception index. Induced abortion. He proposes the abortion index. And postpartum infecundability. He proposes the postpartum infecundability index. So he mentions out of those 11 intermediate variables proposed by Davis and Blake, these seven are the most important. And within these seven, these four are the most important to explain variations over time and between countries. And then these four here, how exactly can you, can you measure them? That's what he proposes with these indices. So he proposed indices for the first four approximate determinants uh, for women in their reproductive years, exactly because those are the approximate determinants that are the most important. And the indices range from zero to one. Zero is the greatest inhibiting effect on fertility and one no inhibiting effect. So the marriage pattern index is pretty much, you just get the proportion of women. So 
One is when all women are married. It's like 100% of women are married in a specific country, specific year. And zero when none are married. And then you have a scale that goes from zero to one. Same thing about contraception. One, when no contraception is used, uh, it's when you have no inhibiting effect. And zero, when all women are using eff effective contraceptives, that's when you have the greatest inhibiting effects of fertility. Abortion. One, when there is no induced abortion, so no inhibiting effect on fertility, and zero, when every pregnancy is aborted, the greatest inhibiting effect on fertility. And finally, postpartum fecundability index. One, when no women are in the period of postpartum fecundability, and zero, when all women are, that's the greatest inhibiting effect. Of course, this index, they vary from zero to one. It's gonna be really hard to find a real example of a country in specific year that have values exactly equals to zero or one. But these are proportions. So it can vary a lot within this range, okay? These indices are proportions that we can analyze them and compare them through time in between countries. And Stover more recently, he proposed some modifications and extensions to the Bongert's model to uh, consider some changes that our society is experiencing in more contemporary years. Use of sexual activity instead of a proportion of marriage as the indicator of exposure to pregnancy would be more appropriate for our contemporary societies because people engage in sexual activity even though they are not married. Extension of the sterility index to measure infecundity from all causes, not just related to involuntary causes. Revision of the contraception index to consider the fact that users of female sterilization could become infecund before the age of 49. So women who, because in that contraception index here, we are saying that we have one when no contraception is used and zero when all women are using effective contraceptives. But when women, they get sterilized, then they have no chance anymore to have children. And from the age in which she got sterilized until at the age of 49, 49 here, just because the standard that we are analyzing only up to that age. And also change of the estimate of total fecundity. It's also based on taking into account uh, the measure of fecundity from all causes, not just for specific causes. Also, pretty much in this portion of the, the, the lecture, we are trying to understand what are the factors that influence fertility? There are these major changes in society, urbanization, industrialization, people invest in education, people invest in going to work. These are these major indirect determinants. So investing on education, on getting good jobs are the social economic determinants, for example. When they, people invest more in education and getting good jobs before getting married, that's the approximate determinant, proportion of getting married. Or that might be also a woman um, are more likely to use contraception. And these ones here are variables that are easier to estimate over time and compare them through populations, okay? But of course, we're always trying to modify these, these frameworks to take into account uh, changes that we have been experiencing in modern societies. Okay? And then we're going to talk now about some major trends in fertility across the world and also in the US. So, high fertility countries. Uh, whenever you say that we have a country with high fertility are those with total fertility rates higher than 3.2 children, 3 children per woman. And that's the case of mostly sub-Saharan African countries. And um, we see also gradual decreases expected 
in a couple of decades. So these countries that are now classified as high fertility countries, they have been experiencing uh, drops in the mortality level. And as we saw in the theory of demographic transition, as these countries experience uh, drops in, in mortality, later on, they will also experience drops in fertility. Low fertility countries, what are, how do we classify low fertility countries? Low fertility countries are those with total fertility rates of two children per woman or less. And that's the case of European, Asian, Latin American, and Caribbean countries. And there is, uh, there has been some slight increases expected in the lowest low fertility rates in the next uh, two decades. There are some countries that have really, really low fertility rates. And these are called the lowest low fertility rate countries. These lowest low fertility countries, they have total fertility rates around 1.3 children per woman, 1.4 children per woman, really low. But why, now that they reach so low levels, why do we expect them to have some increases over time? That's because some of these countries, what happened is that specific generations of women started to postpone the age in which they were having children. Instead of having children at the age of 25 to 29, they would wait a little more and have when they were 30 to 34 or even 35 to 39. So they postponed the age in which they have children when they are more stable, economically speaking, for example. And after they reach more stability in their lives, they will then try to have children. So, but then if you look at the cohort of women, they will maybe still have on average the same number of children as previous generation. But the difference is that now they have at older ages. Let's see, in a hypothetical country, women would have two children uh, on average until they reach exactly 30 years of age. But let's say that their daughters start to postpone having children. And then we start to see that they reach two children, not when they are 30 on average. Let's say that they reach that number when they are 40. So what do you have? For a little period of time, you see a decline in fertility, but if you wait a little bit, that fertility will come up to the levels as previous generations. And the daughters of these daughters, let's say that they keep the same pace. They will reach on average two children by age 40. So everything kind of tends to stabilize again. So let's we talk about three generations. Let's say the grandmothers, my example, two children, on average, until the age of 30. Their daughters, they reach two children on age 40. So there was a delay there. And then the granddaughters will reach two children on age 40 as well. So what you see is that for a period of time, you'll see some postponement in fertility, but then after that, women tend to have children at around the same level, at around the same time, in their childbearing years. So you have what demographers call different effects on fertility, the period effect and the temple effect. Let's say that now, uh, because of urbanization, because of education, be expensive to have a lot of children, women will tend to have instead of six children, on average, they will have two children. Okay, that drop from six children to two children might be a permanent drop because of urbanization, because of education being expensive and so on. But then let's say that we saw in a specific country that level dropping from two to 1.3. But then we afterwards, we saw that 1.3 going back to two. It was just because some of the generation of women they were postponing the age in which they were having children. So it was just a time effect. 
It was not a permanent effect. It was not an effect of that would last forever. So that time effect related to postponement of fertility is called the tempo effect. There is an effect on dropping fertility because women postpone fertility, but then afterwards, when new generations do start to have children at around the same older ages, fertility goes back up. Some, some of these previous declines that we saw in previous years, in previous periods, or the period effect, might have been a result of only postponement of fertility, temporary effects, or the sample effects, okay? So whenever demographers are talking about what are the, uh, this fertility decline that we experienced in uh, these last years, are they period effects or tempo effects? The tempo effects is the idea that it's related to postponing the age in which women have children. Period effect is changes that you see in a specific year. But those changes that you see in specific years might be influenced by the postponement of fertility. And the countries with really low levels of fertility that I just mentioned now, the lowest low uh, fertility countries can be also classified by specific ranges. Bilari and Kohler propose this classification. Countries are classified as being low fertility countries if they have total fertility rates between 1.6 and 2.1 children per woman. And in 2013, there were 43 countries in that group. The very low fertility countries are those with total fertility rates between 1.3 and 1.5 children per woman. And there were around 27 countries in 2013. And the lowest low fertility are those with total fertility rates under 1.3 children per woman. And there were nine countries in, in 2013. Here we, uh, including South Korea, uh, South Korea, Taiwan, Poland, Portugal, Singapore, Hong Kong, and Macau, right? And related to the fact that now we have declines in mortality, declines in mortality make populations increase in size. But you start to have so huge declines in fertility that that might have an influence on depopulation. What is depopulation? It's pretty much the decline in population size. The decline in population size is projected to happen in most countries in 50, 100 years from now. It's pretty much saying that now the overall number of uh, people being born in these countries will be lower than um, the overall people, number of people dying. So you have more people dying than being born, you have a depopulation, population will decline. And to kind of take an indicator to show that to us, we use the rate of natural increase. Remember this term, natural increase. Do you remember the graph about the, demography, uh, the demographic uh, transition theory? and we saw mortality decline and after that fertility decline, the difference between mortality and fertility is natural increase. So the rate of natural increase is the crude birth rate minus the crude death rate. And in those graphs, you see that really clearly. You just get the curve of birth that declines after the curve of mortality get the crude birth rate and crude death rate, which are numbers that are easier to find for all these countries because it's pretty much the overall number of births in a country divided by the population, overall number of deaths divided by the population, and we divide by 10. And just remember here, the crude birth rate and the crude death rate, as we saw in previous slides, they are per, usually we calculate them per thousand we get the number of babies born in specific country in specific year divided by the population. Population means men and women. 
That's why it's birth rate, it's not fertility rate. Fertility rate, you divide only by the female population. Birth rate, you divide by male and female population in total in the denominator. That number would be too small. So we multiply by 1,000. The crude death rate, we get the overall number of people dying in a specific year in a specific country, divided by the population in that year, multiplied by 1,000. We subtract one by the other, there is still in per thousand information. So you divide by 10, you get the information in percentage term. Okay? So the rate of natural increase is shown in percentage terms. Already in 2014, there was no population growth in Europe. They reached a rate of natural increase of 0%. And some other countries with rates of natural increase with zero negative values are Bulgaria and Serbia, around minus 0.5%. Latvia, Lithuania, Hungary, Ukraine, minus 0.4%. You see a lot of those Eastern European countries that after the end of uh, Soviet Union and in, in their communist regimes, they start to experience a lot of socioeconomic issues in the country that related to postponement infertility and that relates to negative rates of natural increase. But Germany, Italy also experiencing negative rate of natural increase in 2014, that's the data that we are using here. That's the same year. And Russia uh, at that time we experienced a rate of natural increase of uh, 0%, so no increase, no decrease. But for these next decades, we expect that the population in Russia will decline exactly because of declines in fertility. So expect population decline from around 144 million in 2014 to 134 million in 2050. Okay. I mentioned to you before, what is this concept of a replacement level of fertility? So total fertility rates at or near replacement of 2.1 are needed for a population to remain stable. We need women to have on average 2.1 children. So those children will replace mothers and fathers in the next generation. In 2013, 79 countries with TFRs, there were 79 countries with TFRs at or lower than the replacement level, showing that we start to see this possibility of uh, depopulation. But not all countries with low total fertility rates experience depopulation because you might experience overall depopulation in those countries, but you still have really large numbers of women in childbearing years. Exactly because in previous generations, you had so high fertility that you still have in the present time, a lot of women between the ages of 15 and 49 years of age, that, that you have an influence on population size. So those countries might not experience depopulation in the short term, exactly because you still have a lot of women uh, in reproductive ages. Um, uh, in terms of lower rates of fertility in African countries have been experienced in more recent years as well. So African countries, usually they tend to have higher mortality rates and higher fertility rates than other countries in the world. But you have also been experiencing some changes, some demographic transitions in a lot of those African countries. So you have been experiencing, you have been, um, demographers have been measuring lower rates of fertility and lower rates of mortality and immigration in those countries. And this trend will be responsible for depopulation, even in some African countries in the next 50 years or so. We saw already some uh, uh, projections by continent, and we saw that the population in Africa as a whole continent will increase 
in these next decades, up to 2050, up to 2100, increasing from 1 billion to 4 billion, as we saw in that video by Hans Rossman. But if you look at specific countries, they might experience depopulation. But some other countries that still have high rates of fertility, they might be the drivers of population increase in Africa. So you might see also some changes in demographic density within the African continent. And we see that Nigeria is one of the countries that will experience a really increase uh, in population size compared to other African countries. So here, discussing a little bit about the implications of low fertility. The fertility decline, what is that? Birth cohorts become smaller. So now, you this pattern and increases in life expectancy leads to an aging population. What does it mean? What is increase in life expectancy? Mortality decline. Mortality decline and fertility decline leads into an older population. What does it mean, an older population? Larger proportion of the population that is at least 65 years, of, uh, 65 years old. And a smaller proportion of population in working ages between 15 and 64 years of age. So fertility decline has, it declines the number of children, the proportion of children in specific countries. Mortality decline increases life expectancy, higher proportion of people in older ages, affects this, uh, it generates this process of an aging population. And just to put in perspective, between 2005 and 2050, the old age dependence ratio will double in developed countries from 22.6 to 44.4%. How do you calculate the old age dependence ratio? We talked about that in previous class, in the class about age sex composition. We get the number of people with at least 65 years of age and divide by the number of people in working ages between 15 and 64, multiply by 100. So in developed countries in 2005, there were around 22% of older people for, uh, for compared to 100 people in working ages but that's going to double. You're going to have 44 people with at least 65 years of age for every 100 people between the ages of 15 to 64. See that all these demographic indicators that we have been talking throughout the semester, they are all related. The dependency ratio, fertility rates, mortality rates, and so on. And exactly because now we're going to have a higher proportion of the population with at least 65 years of age, healthcare and patient programs not well really equipped to handle this large increase of the elderly population might generate problems to specific countries. So a lot of those countries are not well equipped or they have some patient programs that are not efficient in terms of like spending a lot of public government or uh, public money or government federal government money in order to pay pensions and with a population that's increasing in older ages that will make uh that you have negative economic impacts to the countries okay and for the us specifically talking about fertility changes there was a rapid decrease of total fertility rate from seven to under four children per woman between 1800 and 1900. In the early 20th century, fertility kept declining exactly because of rapid economic transition, industrialization, and urbanization, as we, as we have seen 
in other countries, in Western European countries, for example. And the decline in total fertility rate, uh, it's, it's kind of like around two children per woman in more recent years, since the peak at 3.7 children per woman in the late 1950s. And the rate of natural increase, although you have a total fertility rate technically below replacement level, in the US, it's still positive, 0.4% as of data from 2014. And it's the highest one of any of the developed countries, exactly because you still have a high proportion of women in reproductive ages between 15 and 49, so they are still reproducing. But the population is getting older as a whole over time in the US as well. In the US, uh, there is always a concern about adolescent fertility. What exactly is adolescent fertility? Is the age specific fertility rate for a woman age 15 to 19? So, women who are having children between the ages of 15 and 19. And you can also include in those uh, calculations women who are having children between the ages of 10 and 14. Why the analysis of adolescent fertility is important? Because women who have children at younger ages might have long-term impacts on their lives. Women who usually have children at younger ages they will have more time of, uh, of risk or of chances of experiencing pregnancy, so they will end up having more births whenever they reach the age of 49. Women who have children at younger ages, they might drop out from school, so there is a premature, uh, premature end to schooling. And dropping out from school, there is we might experience losses in economic potential. So this woman will not get good jobs in the future. So worse education for this woman, worse job conditions in the future, that might affect the social, economic, and health well-being of their children. So adolescent fertility is a concern for public health, exactly because those women having children at younger ages will have their life impacted in the future as well as their lives of their children. The adolescent fertility rate for the years between 2005 and 2010 were around 48.9 children per 1,000 women between the ages of 15 and 19. In developed countries, of course, this number is below the average, 23.6. In developing countries, 52.7. But there is a lot of variation within developed countries. So in the textbook, it puts the examples of Switzerland, 4.5, and Bulgaria, 42.1. And the US is actually high, 39.7, compared to the average of developed countries. 39.7 children born to women between the ages of 15 to 19. Per 1,000 of these women, between the years of 2005 and 2010. And in developing countries, you also see a lot of variation. North Korea, uh, 0 0.6 per 1,000. In Niger, 209.6 children per 1,000 women between the years, between the ages of 15 and 19, okay? And this is just to show exactly those numbers the adolescent uh, fertility rates in the world, in developing uh, countries, in developed countries. And you see higher in Sub-Saharan Africa, in Africa compared to Latin America and the Caribbean, North America, Asia, Oceania, and Europe. And if you break down even more the specific uh, regions, sub-regions of the world, you also see variation. Middle Africa, really high levels, so almost 150 births every 1,000 women between the ages of 15 
to 19. Western Africa and Eastern Africa also with levels above 100 per 1,000 women between the ages of 15 and 19. So overall in the US, we have seen a decline in adolescent fertility since 1940, possibly due to increases in contraceptive use. Among teenagers, there was a significant increase in the percentage of births to unmarried teenagers. So in 1940, for example, um, only 14% of the births to teenagers in the US were to teenagers that were unmarried. And in more recent years, 2013, 89% of birth to teenagers in the US, those teenagers were unmarried. Why is it important for us to know the marital status of those teenagers? Because teenagers that are getting pregnant and they don't have a family or household, they will have less support, socioeconomic support, and that will affect their lives in terms of education outcomes, economic outcomes, and as we talked before, we will affect the lives of their children or health outcomes of their children. And we can also break down fertility of teenagers for the younger teenagers, those between 15 and 17, and older teenagers, 18 to 19. For these younger teenagers, it was 12.3 births per 1,000 women between those ages, and higher, of course, 47.3 births per 1,000 women between 18 and 19 in the US in 2013. So it's interesting to see these differentials within that age group of 15 to 19. And we can also see differentials by race ethnicity in the US in terms of teenage pregnancy, adolescent, fer uh, adolescent fertility. Asian and Pacific Islanders have on average had on average 7.7 children per 1,000 women between the ages of 15 and 19 in 2014, and Hispanics was much higher, 38. But these levels of adolescent fertility among Hispanic women have been declining in the US in more recent years. But there is still variation by race ethnicity. And here to show the declines in teenage pregnancy or teenage uh, birth rates over time from 1960 to 2013 for women between 15 and 17 and for women between 18 and 19, as I showed before, the rates for those with 18 to 19, the older teenagers is higher than the fertility of younger teenagers. And here, the data by race ethnicity, also by year. Uh, all birth rates for teenagers, it's these four first bars here for 1981, 2007, 2013, and 14, is declining, and it's also declining for all race ethnicity groups. But even in more recent years, you see this variation. So Hispanic population higher, non-Hispanic African American also with higher levels comparing to uh, Native Americans, whites, and Asians, okay? No merit of fertility. It's also another subgroup, another sub-analysis that we can do in demography. That's fertility of women who are not married, widowed, or divorced. They used to be called legitimate fertility when it was not so culture accepted. And the overall marital status of women, it's important for us to uh, know that because it mark, it's a mark of financial, social, and emotional resources. In 2013, 41% of non-marital births, uh, there were a total of 41% of non-marital births out of the total number of all births in the US. And that's a gradual increase since the 1940s. It was very low, only 4% of women in 1940 had children and they were not pregnant, sorry, <laughs> and they were not married. <laughs> and here in 2013, 41% of women had children and they were 
not married. Okay. <laughs> the theme of the class by making the silly mistakes. And you also see the differences by race and ethnicity. Asians had the lowest levels, only 7%, 17% of all Asian births were to unmarried women, and uh, African Americans had the highest, 71% of all births. And non marital births include births to women in, cohab in cohabiting unions and unmarried women not cohabiting. So non marital births might not be only the case of women who are living by themselves. Non marital births might include also those women who are not formally married, but they have the partner live in their house as uh, in a cohabitation union. So they might not be so vulnerable, right? So when you see this, uh, this rate of percent of unmarried uh, women who had uh, children, it's increasing over time, but a lot of these women might have a partner at home. And now we have been seeing an increase in women not wanting to have children at all, mainly due to voluntary childlessness. Okay, so this you start to see a higher percentage of women not wanting to have children, not having children at all, increasing over time. But of course, women who are older, they might postpone a little bit, but then they have children, and these rates here are lower than these other rates. And in the next class on, on Thursday, we will finish this chapter focusing on male fertility. And, um, and then after that, we will continue on mortality. Quiz number nine is already available on Canvas. I knew that I was not going to finish this slide here, so it's going to be one question about the previous uh, chapter about sources of demographic information and one question about the beginning of the fertility chapter, okay? Thank you very much, and I'll see you guys on Thursday.